This video will discuss D2D transitions and the related selection rules in transition metal complexes. We'll briefly start with a review of Beer's Law. And you might remember that Beer's Law says that the absorbance of a solution is proportional to its concentration. And in the equation for Beer's Law, absorbance is a measured quantity of the solution. Uh, the molar absorptivity or the extinction coefficient is given the symbol epsilon. And that usually can be taken to be a measure of the proportionality constant between the absorbance and the concentration. The smaller amount of compound that it takes to make an intense color to the solution, the higher the molar absorptivity is. B is the path length that depends on the length of the solution that the light is passing through. In a spectrometer, the solution is typically placed in a cuvette, which is a container that often has a one centimeter uh, square side to it. And then of course the concentration is usually known and expressed in units of molarity. So that again, to review an electronic spectrum, uh, a, the absorbance of a solution is typically measured as a function of wavelength. Since we know the concentration, we could use Beer's law to make a plot of the molar absorptivity versus wavelength. The molar absorptivity for a solution is typically reported at the peak of the solution uh, or at the peak of the absorbance so, uh, because it is a function of wavelength. So the size of epsilon, as we'll see in a second, tells us something about the type of the electronic transition that produces a peak. So to put it another way, a mole, the MO diagram for a compound tells us something about the energy levels in the complex so that the position of the peak tells us something about the energy separation between two different levels. As we'll see in a bit, epsilon tells us something about the kinds of orbitals between which an electronic transition is occurring. So an electronic spectra, a UV spectrum, is really an energy map of the compound in question. So molar absorptivity depends on the obedience of two selection rules. Uh, the first rule is usually called the Laporte rule, and that says that transition between orbitals of like symmetry are forbidden. And forbidden doesn't really mean that it cannot happen. It just means that the probability is lower, so therefore epsilon, the molar absorptivity, is lower. So if you look at an s orbital, a p orbital, and a d orbital, as are drawn here, if we start at any point on the orbital and invert through the center, we can decide whether or not the wave function is the same or the opposite. So in the case of an s orbital, you can see that we start here, invert through the center, go to something with the same shading, therefore that is classified as being a symmetric orbital or a G type orbital for garata. That's German for even. I think you can see that in a P type orbital, if we start with a shaded and do our inversion, we go to an unshaded region. So that's uneven or U. And then a D orbital again goes back to a G type orbital. So the Laporte rule says that a G to G transition is forbidden U to U is forbidden, but a U to G transition or vice versa are allowed. So if we go to the Laporte rule uh, and try to look at an example for an octahedral complex, let's just start with a picture of a D1 complex. Notice that we could use light to promote an electron from the T2G to the EG star set. And again, if you've ever wondered why these orbitals were called T2G or EG, now you know. It's because they're built out of d orbitals, which are symmetric or garata type orbitals. 
So if an electron is going from T to G to E G starred, it's forbidden by the Laporte rule. And again, this doesn't mean it can't happen. It just means that it will be a relatively unintense transition because epsilon will be small. The second rule is called the spin selection rule. And in this case, changes in electron spin after an electronic transition uh, are forbidden. So the spin state is the number of unpaired electrons plus one. So if we have the electrons arranged as are shown right here, that would be a singlet state because the electrons are paired, so zero unpaired electrons plus one. If we go to an excited state that looks like this, that also counts as a singlet because we've promoted the electron but kept it spin paired, so that can be considered to be zero unpaired electrons uh, plus one, so also a singlet state. But if we flip the spin, then we have two unpaired electrons plus one or a triplet state. So if we start with this as the ground state, I think you can see that we could get a spin allowed singlet state, or we could also get a spin disallowed triplet state. And this situation is more complicated, of course, in a transition metal complex, since we have five d orbitals, which might be filled to varying extents. So therefore we can have multiple possible type of ground and excited states. So how do we assign an absorption peak to the type of transition? Well, this chart tells us how to do it. There are different kinds of transitions that are possible depending on the number of violations that there are of the selection rules. And the fewer violations there are, the larger epsilon the molar absorptivity is. So a fully allowed band will have an epsilon of something on the order of five to 10,000 or even more. So that's telling us again, relatively low concentration will give rise to a very intense absorbance. So that will happen when we have a metal to ligand charge transfer band. We'll talk more about that in a following video or a pi to pi transition in a typical organic compound. If we have an octahedral complex that is uh, in one in which we have a D to D transition, that will produce potentially at least a spin allowed, but a Laporte forbidden band, and it will have a molar absorptivity of about 50, somewhere between five and 50. And if we have a tetrahedral complex, that produces an epsilon value of something on the order of 10 to 400. If you're wondering what the difference is or why there is a difference between those two, remember that in an octahedral complex, there is also a center of symmetry. So there is a ligand exactly 180 degrees from any other ligand. So that acts as if there is a center of symmetry. And on the other hand, a tetrahedral complex doesn't have ligands exact, exactly opposite it. So it helps relax the requirements of the Laporte rule, so epsilon is a little bigger. If we go to the situation where we have a spin forbidden and a Laporte forbidden complex, uh, or transition in a transition metal complex, epsilon will be very small, and epsilon will be on the order of one uh, unit or epsilon unit, um, or even less. So it's important to know this chart because it tells us how to assign the transition in a UV visible spectrum. Remember that gives us insight into the MO diagram where position of the peak tells us about energy difference between bands and the molar absorptivity tells us about the types of orbitals between which the electron is moving.